They said children are dismissed. <laughs> well, uh, that work? Good morning. Um, these are uh, actually fun and exciting times. Uh, may not seem like that. May does it, does it seem like the whole world is going insane? Yeah, the whole world's going insane because of uh, bad ideas, but people are seeing the consequences of the bad ideas, and uh, that's a great time for sharing good news. And uh, so, when, you know, we hear about uh, Robert and Kai, and I, I've been hearing that, those kinds of things a lot, people getting kind of fed up with the way things are and looking for something else. And so um, we as Christians need to be there to... Uh, share the good news of Jesus, and speaking of bad ideas, have you heard about Islam? <laughs> Sam Harris is, a, Sam Harris is a, one of the leaders of the new atheism, and he called uh, Islam the mother load of bad ideas, and I was like, ah, oh, I finally agree with an atheist on something. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be mean here. I actually started studying Islam because my, my best friend was a Muslim. If he'd, been, uh, if he'd been a Mormon or something else, I would have been studying Mormonism. But uh, this was back in college and uh, ended up in a, sharing a hotel room on a school trip with a Muslim. And uh, I, could, I didn't know how devout he was. I knew he was, he was a Muslim. But uh, we went to our room and he was putting away his prayer rug. And I was like, okay, well, he, he brought his prayer rug with him. And uh, so I was sitting there uh, on my bed. I was reading, uh, just going through the Bible in a year, and I was on Isaiah and was sitting there and praying, God, if you want me to talk to this guy, please let him start it. I don't want people calling, you know, saying I'm, a, I'm super mean or something like that for, for uh, criticizing the beliefs of a Muslim. So if you want me to talk to him, please let him start it. And uh, shortly after that, he looks over at me and he goes, so... Are you a hardcore Christian? <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. And that sort of uh, got things started. And we spent years discussing um, Christianity and Islam. And I saw very, very quickly that Islam presents some interesting challenges. So it's called Facing the Islamic Challenge, but it's actually four challenges. And we'll go ahead and, and, and go through some of what those challenges are and what the Bible says about how we should respond to those kinds of challenges. So um, interacting with my friend Nabil, um, it, it, even, in the, even in the first discussion we had, uh, saw some of these challenges arise and then a uh, uh, more sinister one shortly thereafter. But... Uh, Nabil, when we started talking, was very quick to tell me that uh, Islam is proven true by science and uh, mathematics and logic and history, and there's all this evidence out there, and the Quran has been perfectly preserved, unlike the Bible, which is corrupt, and Jesus never claimed this, and Jesus never said that, and so on. And it was interesting because if you talk to Muslims, you find out they are prepared. They are very frequently prepared with objections to Christianity. And Christians typically are not prepared to, one, to respond to those objections, or two, to know anything about Islam. And there are Muslim preachers who take, a, take advantage of that ignorance. They'll go into an area, and whatever message is going to convince people to convert to Islam, they'll say it. Um, in, the, in the 1960s, when... Uh, Islam was becoming popular with people like Muhammad Ali and, and Malcolm X um, in, the, you know, in Harlem, in the African-American community. The, the message that Muslim preachers were preaching was, look, white people enslave black people in Christianity, that's what happens. Uh, but it, Islam liberates people and frees slaves and so on. Christians had no idea how to respond. They had no idea. Muhammad, the, the prophet of Islam, bought, owned, sold, and traded black African slaves, and his followers institutionalized the African slave trade long before the United States even existed. Why didn't anyone point that out when, when the preacher was going around saying that Islam is the religion of equality and so on? Christians didn't know. They had no clue. And so Islam was able to spread. And you see that over and over and over again with pretty much every issue. 
they go in, if, the, if the preacher goes into an area where people uh, believe in women's rights, guess what? Muhammad was a champion of women's rights. He's practically the greatest feminist who ever lived. I'm not exaggerating. Am I exaggerating? Do they say, do they say things like that? So, um, if, if you go into an area that, that respects science, Islam is a fountain of science. The Quran is a scientific masterpiece. It's filled with scientific miracles that couldn't have possibly been known about Muhammad. They'll say, they'll say pretty much anything based on what people are interested in in an area. And Christians are almost always caught off guard. And then people convert. And so they take advantage of the ignorance and I would say, well, if that's, if that's an ongoing problem, maybe there shouldn't be this a atmosphere of ignorance in, among Christians. So, uh, not every Christian is going to be interacting with Muslims, but I would say Christians in general need to at least know uh, the basics. And so we're going to talk about some, several of these challenges. So anyway, back to um, talking to Nabil, uh, and him presenting arguments and then criticisms of Christianity. And one of the things I, I tend to do in a discussion with someone, whether it's a Muslim or an atheist, after I've asked some questions about what that person believes and what his reasons are for believing those kinds of things, I'll eventually just go ahead and ask. I'll say, okay, you've, you've, you've shared with me, you've shared with me and explained to me what you believe. Uh, I have a question for you. If you're wrong, do you want to know it? And I, I've, I've had people say, I've had people say no. Interestingly, it's usually atheists who say no. They'll say, no, I mean, if, if, if your God were true, I, I'd, I'd rather burn in hell than know that God. Which is interesting. These are the guys who claim they only go where the evidence points and so on. They're saying, no, if that's true, I don't want it. Muslims usually say yes. Uh, Nabil was interesting. I asked him that question, and he said, he, thought of, he sat there and thought. And he goes, yes and no. He said, yes, I would want to know the truth about God. He said, but no, because it would destroy my family. And so I started seeing the, the power that um, the idea that you will lose your family over converting uh, has over Muslims. It's, it's kind of psychological pressure. So I, I started seeing those challenges, and we're, we're going to go through them. And then, this is where things got inter really interesting, because uh, Nabil and I became friends really, really quickly. And so I went over to his house one day, because we were going to hang out, and his mom made all this uh, awesome uh, Pakistani food for us. And then I was hanging out with Nabil in his dad's office. And this was shortly after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And Nabil was on the computer, and he, he started cracking up laughing. And he said, here, check out these pictures that my cousin sent me. And so... I don't know if you can make that out, but so this was 2001. This was 2001, and the file, the file was titled New York City Mosque Line 2006. So notice this is supposedly a postcard from 2006, five years later. I don't know if you can make it out, but there are all these mosques and minarets spread uh, across New York City. So the idea was that the, uh, the terrorist attacks had, had cleared the ground for the construction of mosques. Which later on, when they did try to, when they did want to build a ground, a mosque at Ground Zero, I was like, "Whoa, that was, I mean, that was circulating as, as a joke, among Muslims." Now, why this was interesting was, uh, Nabil was from the absolute bar none, most peaceful sect of Islam. They're persecuted by other Muslims, and yet, and yet, this he was cracking up, laughing about this, and uh, there were there were actually three. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we saved them. Uh, so there's the Statue of Liberty with a veil. This is going to be in the future. And then, of course, uh, George W. Bush after he converted. And this was actually funny. I, I, I laughed at this one. I thought that this was funny. So the, uh, the, the strength of these challenges um, was pretty visible in seeing how difficult it was to share the gospel with a Muslim because, as we're about to see, they, there's a lot of obstacles to becoming a Christian for them. And so, like, you know, I, it took me a while to become a Christian. Um, 
a few months of seriously looking into things. Uh, my wife, she was raised uh, as a Christian and eventually lost her faith in college. But when I started talking to her, it was about, it was about two weeks, about two weeks before she became a Christian. And Nabil, it was, it was four years. And it's because Islam puts a lot of stumbling blocks in the way of someone uh, becoming a Christian. Anyway, uh, after about four years, Nabil um, gave his life to Jesus, and that's his baptism. And that is me in the background thinking, cool, I'm done with Islam. <laughs> Again, I was studying Islam because my best friend was a Muslim. My best friend was no longer a Muslim. Done with Islam. I can deal with things I'm more interested in. Uh, but over time, I realized something. Watching the stand that Nabil uh, took for the gospel after he became uh, a Christian, I started realizing Muslims make really cool Christians. <laughs> and so I ended up saying, and, and there, there were other things like Muslims uh, started challenging him to debates and so on. They wanted to expose him and say that his reasons for converting were bad. And I was like, well, if you're messing with him, you're going to be messing with me too. So I ended up debating as well and uh, just never, never ended up getting away from it. And um, so here, here we are, here we are all these years later still dealing with Islam. But let's go, go ahead and go through some of these challenges and see what the biblical response is. So challenge number one, Islam contradicts the core teachings of the gospel. And Islam, on this issue, Islam looks a little too perfect to me as far as what it denies. It looks like too perfect to be just some random guy coming up with ideas because, uh, you know, we're told to preach the gospel. Uh, we're told that the gospel in the book of Acts, wherever the apostles went, they tended to focus on three important ideas. One, Jesus died on the cross for sins. Two, he rose from the dead. And three, he is Lord. So those seem to be the core elements of the Christian gospel according to the apostles themselves. And Islam comes along. And we're told, Christians are warned, false teachers and false prophets are going to come. They're going to mess with that message. Muhammad comes along and he agrees with Christians on almost, uh, almost, all, kind, almost all of the otherwise important issues. So Muhammad comes along and it's, hey, you Christians believe in God? So do I. You believe that God sent prophets into the world? So do I. You believe that God has revealed scriptures? So do I. You believe that, that God revealed the Torah? So do I. You believe that he sent Jesus with the gospel? So do I. You believe that Jesus lived the most miraculous life in history? So do I. You believe he's the Messiah? So do I. You believe he's coming back to judge? So do I. Agrees on all these issues. Issues that almost no one else agrees with us on. You believe Jesus was born of a virgin? So do I. Believed all these things. But he said, there are just three little things that we can't agree on. And we'll have to fight over these. Uh, Jesus didn't die on the cross for sins, he didn't rise from the dead, and he's not Lord. Now, if we could just get past those. <laughs> and so the Christian response should be, wow, this is just too perfect of a false prophet here. This is exactly, we've been waiting on you, buddy. That should have been, that should have been the Christian response. Uh, but let, let's look at a couple of examples of um, claims in the Quran. Surah 4, verse 157 to 158. They, this is the, they here are the Jews, so the Jews said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. Notice the, the Jews who are boasting about killing Jesus call him Christ. You ever, you ever seen a Jew call Jesus Christ? And, right? uh, yes, Jews who believe in Jesus call him, call him Christ. You don't, see, um, you don't see a lot of Jews who uh, would, would make fun of Jesus uh, still calling him Christ uh, and call him the messenger, messenger of Allah. That's the, the Arabic version of God. We killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, but they killed him not nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up unto himself and Allah is exalted in power wise. So Jesus wasn't even killed according to the, the standard interpretation of this verse. Allah rescued him. And if you've heard the story of what happened, the most common view is that Allah took Jesus, rescued Jesus, 
then took Judas, disguised him to make him look like Jesus, and then had Judas crucified in his place. That's not in the Quran. That's just, a, that's just the, the, the most common view I hear from Muslims. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's called substitution theory. God substitutes someone else, puts him in Jesus' place. Now, now think about that. Think about that gospel reversal there. Where Jesus dies on behalf of the guilty in Christianity. And here we hear from our Muslim friends, no, the guilty Judas died on behalf of the innocent Jesus. Again, these, these things are like too perfect as far as if you're looking for, for false teachings and false prophets. So Muslims don't, generally don't believe that Jesus died on the cross. And obviously if he didn't die on the cross, he didn't die on the cross for sins. And even if he had died on the cross, that wouldn't uh, mean that he died on the cross for sins. Surah 6, verse 104 of the Quran, say, what shall I seek a Lord other than Allah? And he is the Lord of all things, and no soul earns evil but against itself, and no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. Then to your Lord is your return, so he will inform you of that in which you differed. Uh, it says this over and over again in the Quran, no bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another, meaning no one's going to bear your sins for you. Talking about a burden of sins. And th this is kind of a side note, but Muslims look at this and they say, see, in Islam, no one can bear the sins of another. And a lot of these claims are actually open doors for preaching the gospel. D does this, notice, does this actually say no one can bear the burden of another? What, what's it actually say there? No bearer of burden shall bear the burden of another. In other words, no, no one who has a burden of sin is going to bear. Is, is the Christian claim that Jesus, who had his burden of sin, is, is going to bear the burden of, of other people? No, that's not. That, that is not the claim. Uh, just so you know, Jesus is also sinless according to Islam. Muhammad wasn't according to Islam. Muhammad said, uh, Satan touches every child born in the world, but he couldn't touch Jesus. Jesus is sinless. So you can actually use this when they make the claim, say, well, we're not saying some bear, you know, someone who already had a burden of sins was able to, was able to uh, bear the burden of, for other people. We're talking about the sinless Jesus. Surah 9, verse 30. And the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. Have you ever heard a Jew say Ezra is the son of Allah? No, neither has anyone else ever. So we don't even know where this is coming from. And the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before. Allah's curse be upon them how they are turned away. So we are being cursed by Allah for saying that Jesus is the son of God. And in Surah 5, verse 116, Allah responds to the doctrine of the Trinity. So the Trinity is being denied in Surah 5. And finally, we get to the explanation of what is being uh, denied. Surah 5, verse 116, and remember when Allah will say on the day of resurrection, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto men, worship me and my mother as two gods besides Allah? He will say, glory be to you, it was not for me to say what I had no right to say. Had I said such a thing, you would surely have known it. Uh, who's in the Trinity according to the Quran? Yeah, holy little family there, right? And here's what's interesting because I understand Muhammad not really knowing what the doctrine of the Trinity is. I understand Muhammad walking around, he, you know, he hears Christians talking about the Trinity and he hears Christians talking about the Father and he hears, talk, hears Christians talking about the Son and he hears Christians talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus and thinking, oh, that's, that's what they mean when they talk about the Trinity. I understand Muhammad making that mistake. I don't understand Allah making that mistake. If Allah is all-knowing, I don't understand Allah making that mistake because this is supposedly, this is Allah. So when Allah makes this kind of mistake, it's either, okay, you got two options here, my Muslim friends. Uh, either Allah is ignorant, he doesn't know what Christians believe because no, this has never been any Christian doctrine of the Trinity. So either, either Allah is ignorant, he doesn't know what Christians believe, or he does know what Christians believe and he's lying about it to misrepresent it. So which one? He's ignorant or deceptive? Take your picks, one or the other, when he says that this is what we believe. All right, so you have these kinds of claims, but notice it's uh, denying the core uh, claims of the gospel. And what would the Christian response to this kind of challenge be? Well, 
1 Peter 3.15 is where we get our word apologetics. But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. So again, this is where, this is where uh, apologetics uh, comes from. Apologion is the word for give a defense here, and it was a, it was a term used in court. It was, it was the defense would be a defense against the accusations that the prosecution brought. And so the claim here is if someone is criticizing or asking about uh, your beliefs as a Christian, you should be ready to give an account for why you believe those things. And so I'll just give, I'll just give a quick example here because we, we do have other challenges to get to, but if you wanted to know the three most common things you'll hear from Muslims, it's going to be versions of these three things. Uh, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? So these are, they're, they're going to ask you for proof text that show that Jesus is, uh, is, is, is divine, that he's God. Um, and then another question, how can God die? So if you're claiming that Jesus is God, and you're claiming that, that Jesus died, how, do you, how can you possibly reconcile those things? Notice they're, they're missing the whole doctrine of the incarnation there. Like you you kind of need the incarnation. Yes, I understand God as he exists in himself uh, doesn't die, uh, but you have an incarnation. Interestingly, they have, something, they have something similar in Islam that you can point out. Uh, their view of the Quran is that the Quran is the eternal speech of Allah. But it, it has to, in our world, it comes in the form of a book. Now, the, the speech is eternal, but in our world, it has to take on the form of a book. And so you've got, the, you've got the book, but the book has a beginning, and the book can fall apart. The book is made of paper and glue and ink. The book can be destroyed. So you can actually use that to explain, hey, wait a minute, if you're saying that something eternal can't enter creation and take on a physical nature and so on. So anyway, the point is, if someone destroyed a Quran, they would not say that the eternal speech of Allah was destroyed. Okay, so if God enters creation as Jesus of Nazareth, we wouldn't say that if he dies, then he has somehow ceased, the eternal divine nature has somehow ceased to exist. So I'll point out things like that. Um, I'll just focus on this, this last one here. Uh, the Bible has been corrupted. Because as long as you can show something from the Bible, as long as you can show, look, here's what the incarnation is right here. Here are the claims that Jesus makes about himself. Here's what the Bible says about the crucifixion. Here's what the Bible says about the resurrection. As long as you can show it from the Bible, then they have to say, well, that's been corrupted. Because the Quran teaches that Allah revealed the scriptures to the Jews and the Christians. So if those scriptures do not line up with Islam, they're forced to say, well, that must have been corrupted at some point. And they'll say it was corrupted by the Apostle Paul or the Council of Nicaea and so on. Um, they've got a problem, though. And so th this is why I'm going to just focus on responding to this one real quick. Because if you, can, if you can respond to this last one, the Bible's been corrupted, then you're good to go, as long as you can defend anything else you're saying from the Bible. So Surah 3, verses 3 to 4. He, talking about Allah, has revealed to you the book with truth, verifying that which is before it. And he revealed the Torah and the gospel aforetime, a guidance for the people, and he sent the Quran. So Allah revealed the Torah, the gospel, and the Quran. And so your average Muslim will know that that's what Islam teaches, but they'll believe that, oh, it must have been corrupted at some point. Problem is, Allah and Muhammad seem to have no clue that the Bible has been corrupted, because they keep, they keep affirming the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of the Jewish and Christian scriptures. So there are way more verses than what we're going to go through. This is all throughout the Quran. We'll look at a couple of passages real quick. Surah 7, verse 157. Those who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in their own scriptures, in the Torah and the gospel, it is they who will prosper. So supposedly the Torah and the gospel are still being read, and these things supposedly contain prophecies about Muhammad. But notice, if you believe the Torah and the gospel have been corrupted, why would you be pointing the Torah and the gospel as, con as confirming Muhammad? It doesn't make sense, unless you think they're reliable. If you're saying they're corrupted, why wouldn't passages about Muhammad, in the, supposedly in the Bible, be corrupted? Surah 18, verse 27 of the Quran, and recite what has been revealed to you of the book of your Lord. There is none who can alter his words. Who can change Allah's words? The Apostle Paul? 
the Council of Nicaea. By the way, side note, anytime you hear someone saying the Council of Nicaea corrupted scriptures, Council of Nicaea had absolutely nothing to do with Christian scriptures. So whenever someone says that, you've, you've just run into someone who has no clue what they're talking about or, or they're making things up. Uh, but according to the Quran, no one can change Allah's revelations. You can't do it. So they're contradicting Allah. Wait, you, my Muslim friend, you're saying people changed Allah's words. Allah says no one can change his words. You, you, you're saying he's wrong? What else did he get wrong? Surah 5, verse 47. It's an interesting passage because um, a few verses earlier in verse 43, some Jews come to Muhammad to settle a dispute because he's a political leader by this time. Some Jews come to Muhammad and say, hey, you, can, you should judge this, this dispute. And Allah's response in verse 43 is, why are they coming to you when they have the Torah? And they're ordered to judge by the Torah, not, not, by, not by the Quran and not, not by Muhammad. A few verses later, we have this, Surah 5, verse 47. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah hath revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by the light of what Allah hath revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. What are we commanded? What are Christians commanded to judge by? Not the Quran. The Quran doesn't order us to judge by the Quran. The Quran orders us to judge by the gospel. The Quran orders Jews to judge by the Torah. And the next verse says what Muslims judge by. Muslims judge by the Quran. So, pretty obvious question. If the gospel has been corrupted and the Torah has been corrupted, why in the name of common sense would Allah order us to judge by those and not by, not by the Quran? Surah 5, verse 68, say, O people of the book, you have no ground to stand upon unless you stand fast by the Torah, the gospel, and all the revelation that has come to you from your Lord. Does that sound like he's telling us not to judge by the Torah and the gospel? Notice, I mean, this is, this, this is very important in a discussion with Muslims when they say your Bible's been corrupted because they're saying the exact opposite of what their God says. Their God and their prophet order us to judge by our scriptures that are supposedly reliable and revealed by God. And Muslims say, no, don't judge by those scriptures. They've been corrupted. And interestingly, the Torah and the gospel weren't just authoritative for Jews and Christians. They were authoritative even over Muhammad and his revelations. Muhammad uh, sometimes had doubts that he was actually receiving revelations from God. Uh, his first impression was that he, was that he was demon possessed. Sometimes your first impression is the correct one. You know what I mean. <laughs> but um, he, he he sometimes had doubts early on, and this is Allah's response to Muhammad when he's doubting. This is Allah speaking to Muhammad here, Surah ten, verse ninety four. But if you, O Muhammad, are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, ask those who read the book before you. Certainly the truth has come to you from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the disputers. Christians and Jews are called the people of the book. Allah tells Muhammad, hey, if you're, if you're doubting your revelations, go make sure they line up with the revelations of the Jews and Christians. Well, it doesn't exactly work if they have corrupt scriptures. I wish Muhammad would have performed this test, by the way. Would have been good. But notice, you can invite Muslims to perform this test since, since Muhammad didn't. Uh, our scriptures are the standard. And his, his teachings have to line up with ours, according to the Quran. So um, Muslims look at it and say, oh, if the, if the Quran doesn't line up with the Torah and the gospel, so much for the Torah and the gospel. Whereas according to the Quran, if the Quran doesn't line up with the Torah and the gospel, so much for the Quran. So um, again, as long as you have, you, you don't need to know all of those, but it's good to have a couple of them handy if you uh, ever need them. And if you can defend your scriptures just by pointing out what their scriptures confirm about our scriptures, then uh, you'll be on pretty solid ground for those discussions. All right, so that's challenge one. The, the first challenge is um, the solution to the, first pro to the first challenge is apologetics according to the Bible. Uh, challenge number two, Islam offers deceptive arguments to promote Muhammad and the Quran. And here again, I'm not, I'm not saying this to be mean. When, when an atheist looks around and says, look at all the suffering in the world, how can, you know, how can God be behind this? I don't think he's trying to be deceptive there. I don't agree with the argument, but he's not trying to deceive me. Whereas in Islam, uh, Hatun, you, you've been around these guys for a really long time. Do they say things that they know are not true? Yeah, they do. And some, they're, some of their most popular arguments are just completely fab fabricated. 
So there's three common ones. We're not, we're not, we're not going to go through these. I just wanted you to be aware of them. Uh, the Quran has been perfectly preserved. We'll say that the Quran was, has been miraculously preserved from the time of Muhammad so that no two copies of the Quran have ever differed in even a single letter. It's, it's miraculously preserved. That is complete, utter, total nonsense. Fortunately, they're now backing off that and, and acknowledging that that was deceptive. Actually, that was you. You did that. I mean, we, we all spent years showing from their own sources and showing from manuscripts and so on that uh, the Quran has changed over time. According to their own sources, entire chapters were lost because people stopped reciting them. Um, large passages were lost when the only people who had them, who knew them, died in battle. Verses were eaten by a sheep when that was the only copy and those verses were lost. So these are, what, these are the things you read about in their sources. Um, but they tended to ignore those things and, until one day H Hatun showed up at Speaker's Corner with 27 different 27 copies of different Arabic Qurans, not 27 translations, 27 different Arabic Qurans, and put them in people's faces. Is that verse the same as that? Is it? And uh, fortunately, fortunately, now they're backing off that one. Then there's the claim that the Quran is filled with these scientifically accurate statements. Um, that is now being abandoned. They're now acknowledging that that was complete. You're not, you know this, you've seen it, right? You've seen it. They've, they're acknowledging, okay, this was pure deception. And uh, there, some, some of their leading apologists saying, you, you know, it was great that, it was great that we had that because that, that helped us to convert to Islam, but yeah, it was all deception, but we're glad we stayed. <laughs> Muhammad is prophesied in the Bible. That's a little bit more difficult for them to back off of because that one, that one comes directly from the Quran. But what is the, what is the biblical response to this sort of challenge? Second Corinthians 10, three through five. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The Apostle Paul does say we, we, we demolish arguments when they get in the way of the gospel. And so if you're dealing with, um, dealing with arguments and... These arguments are standing in the way of people accepting the gospel, then you demolish those arguments. And what's, what's interesting is I, I saw this with Nabil. Nabil eventually acknowledged, because we're discussing apologetics and what the actual evidence is for uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion and his resurrection and his divine nature and the reliability of the New Testament and so on. And Nabil told me after he became a Christian, he said, back when we were discussing these things, I was actually thinking, Wow, Christians actually do have good, good reasons for what they believe. But even if they show me with 99% certainty that their claims are true, I'm still 100% sure that Islam is true because of the scientific miracles and the perfectly preserved Quran and prophecies about Muhammad and so on. So these arguments, which were completely bogus, but he didn't know that, were actually a hindrance to him because he thought he had a slam dunk case for Islam. He only started taking the gospel seriously when he no longer had that confidence because we went, we started going through those arguments. So um, I, I'm pointing this out because I have seen Christians who don't want to interact with arguments and think that, ah, you know, I just preach Jesus. I don't have to, uh, I don't have to deal with arguments. The Bible says we demolish them. So that's the biblical response to that challenge. Uh, challenge number three, I briefly mentioned this when I said that Nabil's answer to the question if you're wrong, do you want to know it? Was yes and no, and he's worried that it would, it would destroy his family. But Islam places massive barriers between Muslims and the gospel. Here I'm talking about like psychological barriers. Because Christians, you know, we preach the good news. We preach to our Muslim friends. But according to Islam, who knows what the worst possible sin is in Islam? Shirk, shirk the sin of shirk. That is associating a partner with God. So if you say Jesus is Lord... You're associating a partner with God. The worst sin you can possibly commit in Islam is saying Jesus is Lord. That is a one-way ticket to hell. Muslims also understand that very frequently they're going to have to give up their family. Their family is going to shun them if they convert to Christianity. can do much worse than that because the penalty, according to Muhammad, for leaving Islam is death. And so if, but, you know, if you're in the West, you don't think someone's going to chop your head off or something be, for, for uh, 
leaving Islam. But uh, I've heard over and over and over again, I told, my I told my family that I became a Christian and my father told me, don't ever show up here again until you are uh, back to being a Muslim. And so we preach the good news. And what a Muslim is hearing is, oh, so you want me to believe this thing that will cause me to have to give up my entire family and my community and maybe get my head chopped off and definitely get me sent to hell for all eternity. You're calling that good news? Because it sounds like the worst news ever. That's what they're hearing. And so part of that, the biblical response to part of that as well would be apologetics. You're, you're showing them why, no, saying that Jesus is Lord is not the worst possible sin. It's, it's actually true. Uh, so that would be apologetics. But there's that additional feature where you may have to give up your family. And notice, this would be very similar to first century Jews who were converting to Christianity. And that was a concern. So we actually have the biblical response here. Mark 10, 29 to 30. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake, but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in the present age houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Notice, hey, if you're giving up your family, if you're giving up your family, guess what? You're getting, a, you're getting a bigger family, which is the church. You have a new family. I'd actually had that discussion with Nabil when, you know, things were going on with his family. Fortunately, he never totally broke things off, but there was a lot of arguing and so on, and he, he said, I feel like I'm losing my family. I was like, Nabil, we're your family. We're your family now. Um, and so I think it actually needs to be, it needs to become clear. This needs to become common knowledge in the Muslim community somehow that, hey, if your family abandons you, we're, we're, we're here for you. We're here to help you. We're here. Uh, we're, we're your new family. And so uh, that's, the, that's the biblical response to that challenge is the church will take care of you. The church is your new family. And finally, challenge number four, Islam calls for jihad and the global implementation of Sharia. That's Islamic law. Trust me on this one. We're not going into it, but you do not want to live under Islamic law. You do not want to live under Sharia. Uh, but let's just look at a couple of passages real quick. Surah 9, verse 29 of the Quran orders Muslims to fight those who do not believe in Allah nor the last day nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Notice, this is not fight people in self-defense. This is fight those who do not believe. And Christians and Jews, we actually have a higher status in Islam, so this just calls for our violent subjugation. Notice it, it we're, we're to be fought until we pay tribute money and acknowledge our inferiority and we accept a, a second class uh, status in society. We actually have it better than you know, polytheist or, or atheist who would be required to convert or die or maybe run really, really fast. A couple more passages, uh, Surah 9 verse 73, O prophets strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Uh, the word for strive hard there, by the way, is jihad, wage jihad against the unbelievers, and, and notice, unbelievers and hypocrites. So the hypocrites are people who claim to be Muslims but aren't, aren't actually living how they're supposed to live or believing what they're supposed to believe. We always heard when ISIS was, ISIS was killing Shia Muslims, ah, see, they're not Muslims because they're killing fellow Muslims. You are literally ordered to wage jihad against hypocrites, against Muslims who are following the wrong, uh, the wrong approach. Surah 9, verse 123, O you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardest. Notice again, this is not fight in self-defense. This is fight unbelievers. Surah 48, verse 29, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Those who are with him are severe against who? Disbelievers. Merciful towards whom? Themselves. Only themselves. Interesting. Keep in mind, I'm not saying that every Muslim you run into is going to be like this. Most Muslims here in the West wouldn't be like this. This is what the Quran commands, though. Sahih Muslims, so this is, this is the, these are the commands of Muhammad. 
The messenger of Allah said, I've been commanded to fight against people till they testify that there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and they establish prayer and pay zakat, and if they do it, if they do it, if they accept this, then their blood and property are guaranteed protection on my behalf, except when justified by law, and their affairs rest with Allah. Notice he's been commanded to fight who? People. It's pretty, it's pretty broad there. Until what? Until they testify there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So fight until you convert. And finally, a passage from Musnad Ahmed. This is Muhammad. The prophet of Allah said, The whole earth has been shown to me until I saw the east of the east and the west of the west, and I saw the authority of Islam ruled all that I saw. So Islam is going to subjugate the entire world, and Muslims are going to carry out that subjugation. So uh, that, that's kind of a challenge. I'd say that's a challenge. Um, biblically, the, the governments should be dealing with, with the bulk of that challenge. Right? Uh, and you actually, you actually find this in a passage here in Acts. In Acts 25, the Roman leader, Roman local Roman ruler Festus, uh, wants to hand Paul over, take Paul to Jerusalem. He knows there's a plot to kill Paul there, but he wants to do, um, do the, the Jewish leaders there a favor. And so we read, Festus, wishing, to do, wishing to, do, to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have done nothing wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Now, there, there was eventually a Roman persecution, so things didn't work out, but notice what Paul says here. He says, hey, if I have not actually done something wrong, no one has the right to punish me. He's, he's appealing to the Roman leader saying, your job here is to defend my rights. Your job here is to protect life and protect the rights of people. So if the Apostle Paul could say that, I would say that we can, uh, we can tell our governments, hey, uh, stop supporting this stuff, and you need to be protecting people's rights. And whenever possible, you need to be protecting the rights of people who are suffering because of the commands of Allah and Muhammad in the Quran. So these are, these are the uh, various challenges that Islam presents to Christians, and we see the biblical response in all of these cases. Notice this is not, this is not a, a lot, this is not a ton of, ton of ideas here. This is all pretty, simp this is all pretty straightforward if, if someone is, you know, presenting arguments against Christianity, then, you know, defend the gospel. If someone is presenting bad arguments for some alternative position, then re refute those bad arguments. If uh, people are worried that they, of what they'll have to give up because they're becoming Christians, say, hey, we're here for you. And if there are people who want to violently subjugate the entire world, biblically, uh, governments are supposed to protect us from those kinds of things. And so and we can actually call on them and say, hey, you have to protect us from these kinds of things. And I think if we get down these basics, uh, if, if the church as a whole got down these basics, notice uh, when a Muslim comes in and says, hey, you know, the gospel's wrong because of this and that, I mean, Christians actually knew just the basics. Actually, actually, your book, your book commands me to judge my, my, by my book, and my book contradicts your book. So according to your book, I have to reject your book. That's your book. your book. Your book is telling me to judge by my book. My book says re reject your book and reject your prophet. Problem solved. Notice, you can even put that in a dilemma for them. Hey, there are two possibilities here. Either we have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, or we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God. It's one or the other. If, we, if Christians have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, Islam is false because your book contradicts our book on basic doctrines. So if we have the word of God, Islam is false. If we don't have the inspired, preserved, authoritative word of God, your book is still wrong because your book affirms the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our book. So if we, have the word, if we don't have the word of God, your book is wrong. If we have the word of God, your book is wrong. If we don't have the word of God, your book is wrong. Either way, your book is wrong. Can you imagine if that were just standard Christian response when in, in discussions with Muslims? It go very well. So anyway, it's easy to get discouraged with everything that's going wrong in in society in the world, and it's easy to get discouraged uh, as Islam spreads 
um, and we hear about people converting to Islam. Uh, but, I mean, these are exciting times. These are exciting times. Christians for 14 centuries could not have dreamed of the opportunities right now that we have to share the gospel with Muslims. Back, you know, back in the day, you had the Muslim world over here and the Christian world over there. If you're a Christian who wanted to reach Muslims with the gospel, you'd have to go over there, and you had a good chance of getting your head chopped off if you were remotely successful in making disciples. Whereas now, right now while I'm talking, you could, take, you could talk to a Muslim in Saudi Arabia if you wanted on your phone, on social media. Combine that with the fact that for 14 centuries, we did not have access to their sources to expose false claims about uh, Islam that allowed Muslim preachers to take advantage of people's ignorance. Now, all of a sudden, we have all their sources. You can, you can, you can look them up online. You can expose all the lies online. So Islam has been growing, and just when we get to the point where researchers are actually saying that Islam is soon going to be the dominant religion of the world, which would be their dream scenario because Islam calls for the violent subjugation of the rest of the world. Just when that's about to happen, we suddenly get everything we could possibly need to refute this and share the gospel. And so I look at it like, the Lord has delivered your prophet into our hands. And so these are good times. And I actually believe that we are going to see more Muslims come to Christ in our lifetimes than all previous generations combined. <coughs> and we'll, we'll see if I'm right. But uh, now we have a, we're going to have a testimony from Hatun. What's that? Oh, that's after? Oh, okay. Well, well you know what's coming.